Oh, no pictures, stop it. <laughs> Gangster Dave Courtney freely admits to committing murder, grievous bodily harm, armed robbery, extortion, and a long list of other serious crimes. One move and I'll soak you. <laughs> he is one of the leading figures in Britain's criminal underworld and has so many contacts in organized crime that he's been called the Yellow Pages of gangland Britain. I'll take that glass out of your hand, Lou. You look fucking tremendously like a debt collector like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've just come round for some ice, mate. Ready? Yeah, I'll point again at but Dave Courtney, the thieving, murdering villain, has decided to cash in on his notoriety and become Dave Courtney, celebrity gangster. We're all registered childminders. It's that Christmas card photo. <laughs> Courtney's reputation was built on his ruthless methods and extensive criminal connections throughout Britain. At the height of his criminal career, he was asked to provide security for Ronnie Cray's funeral. But it was his ostentatious display of muscle at the Cray funeral which was to prove his undoing. Not guilty! Not guilty! <laughs> They've had about 500 flat-nosed geezers working for him, you know. A proper, proper big firm. I mean, they're all his friends, and they can call them up at any time. This show of power did not impress the police, who began to shut down his various operations. I certainly suffered for being his friend, uh, from the point of view of attention from the uh, authorities. You know, since I did the crazy funeral, I can speak for myself, uh, that caused a lot of attention for me. The daft thing is, all we were doing was security. Right? There, was nothing, there was nothing other than that. You know, we did a very good job on the day, and I think if we hadn't have been there, I think there would have been riots in the streets. Um, and I think any police officer who was on that would know the same. Had the authorities left me to my own devices, I'd have still been bobbing along quite happily as a criminal. But, um, once so I actually, what I thought was going to be the best career move of my life, was to do the Crater Funeral, it actually was the exact opposite and brought me to the attention of the authorities as a major player in the crime game and they then, from then on, systematically decided to shut down every avenue that I was earning money at. But although Courtney's empire had taken a bashing, an alternative career was about to present itself. In November 1998, Piers Hernew interviewed him for Front magazine. He's um, a great character and he's kind of up for self-publicity and promotion. He's got some fantastic stories, he's also very funny. And I thought, well, I'm looking for columnists. I just said to Dave, would you mind writing a page every month? And as we say in the magazine, you know, each month, the dodgepot writes about whatever he wants, you try stopping it. The success of Dave's column in Front magazine drew the attention of Ray Moody at Virgin Publishing. Moody was eager to cash in on the public's fascination with gangsters, and he felt there was money to be made from Courtney's gruesome history. So he invited Courtney to write his autobiography. It never ceased to amaze me that the public's um, insatiable appetite for uh, the celebrity villain, if you like, uh, there's been a lot of them and go a long way back as well. We've targeted it uh, very much at the lads market, the laddish market. Um, precedents have been made with the governor and, and pretty boy, etc. Um, so we really jumped on that bandwagon, uh, unashamedly. Uh, it's a commercial venture and uh, it proved uh, to be very successful for us. Within a few weeks of publication, Courtney's book reached number four in the bestseller list. He was riding a wave of gangster chic, and the public's love affair with true crime went beyond books. The music industry also seemed to have developed a fascination with gangsters. I'm Dave Courtney. My position in sort of the London crime scene is I have under my command 500 six foot flat nose geezers. In 1999, New York based musician Tricky and producer Gareth Bowen were so intrigued by Courtney they decided to track him down in order to make a record with him. The music that's doing it in America is, is gangster rap, and the man that's really doing it in that scene is Tricky. Huh? So they just sort of made 10 tunes up with him and a man called Gareth. And we all got ten, the most ten famous living 
naughty men spoke for a couple of hours on their lives and he sort of cut it up and put just odd sentences and odd words that you said into the music that had already made so we've all sort of done a gangster rap record and it's called product of the environment and it's very very good it's something i'm quite proud of actually i'm looked at as an army i'm called in london the yellow pages for the underworld It's not being a villain I find addictive, it's the lifestyle around it. I, I seen the celebrity in him straight away, see? Like, um, and he's one of the funniest guys I've ever met. You should, I think people should have a chance. And all just, like, and when you say about him being a murder, like, um, you know, it all depends on the situations of the murder. Like, um, he told me a couple of stories, certain situations, you're dealing with certain people, if you're in that life, you know what I mean? And. He's done it for survival. A couple of things he's done to survive. You know what I mean? It's like, get or get got. I always seem like, see him as somewhere like, he's like larger than life. He'd make a brilliant superstar, you know? He'd make a brilliant personality or actor. It's two months since the launch of Courtney's autobiography and his celebrity career is gathering momentum. Tonight he's attending the premiere of a short film directed by aspiring filmmaker Nick Moorcroft, in which Courtney has a small part playing a psychotic businessman in a lift. It soon became apparent to myself after a little bit of research that the company belongs to and is licensed to a certain Mr. Brockley, not New World Encyclopedia's LTD. <laughs> What's actually happened is, um, I've got the tiniest part in the whole film. I'm actually playing a lunatic. I don't know why they gave me that part, but they did anyway. And uh, so I thought I'd take care and charge of it, and I've put off giving my the doorman for the reception party for nothing. And as soon as they were my doorman, I've invited 85 of my mates. <laughs> so we all get them for free, so I've turned it into my film debut instead of Johnny's. And it is John, it is John's thing, but um, most of the people here think it's mine. <laughs> It is a cheeky monkey shot, but I um, had to do it. Courtney's talent for self-promotion is beginning to pay off. London's fashionable media set are falling over themselves to be Courtney's friend. There also appears to be another camera crew following him. They say they're from ITV and that Courtney has promised them exclusive access to make a documentary about him. There's, there's lots of other film crews floating around, not necessarily doing stuff with Dave Courtney, but doing other, uh, uh, doing stuff with other other villains, other gangsters. Uh, it seems to be sort of gangster chic at the moment, so we keep bumping into crews all the time. Courtney has had a large portrait of himself painted on the side of his house, depicting himself as King Arthur wearing a knuckle duster necklace. He is warming to his new life as a celebrity and claims to have given up crime for good. I, I can only act this way because I'm no longer active. No, you, you can't drive around doing it, look at me, I'm a gangster. But look, if you really are a gangster, because you'll end up in prison. Now, I wanted to be a retired gangster before I was a gangster. I wanted to live the lifestyle of the uh, Freddie Foreman's, Frankie Fraser's, Tony Lambriano's, Charlie Richardson's, Jay Powell's, Bruce Reynolds. I wanted that um, respect before I even decided that I was going to be a gangster. I wanted the respect that they had, and they are all retired gangsters, so I got in and out, and I'm now living the, the, the lifestyle that I, I wanted. Yeah, well, being a celebrity gangster is like a contradiction of terms. Gangster is one thing, a celebrity is another thing. You don't get celebrity gangsters, do you? You know what I mean? The problem for Courtney is, the further he gets away from his life of crime, the more his glamour is likely to fade. Worse still, his celebrity career isn't paying as well as he had hoped, and he is fast running out of money. Villain 
dreams from being uh, vilified by the media. They're now being fed on the celebrity circuit. This is a recent phenomenon. Sort of the fine lines between infamous and famous are getting a little bit blurred. And these guys are becoming celebrities. Sculptor Nick Reynolds and photographer Anthony Oliver have included Courtney in an exhibition of busts and photographs of Britain's most infamous villains, including Freddie Foreman, Mad Frankie Fraser, and Nick's own father, Bruce Reynolds. Well, it's a very personal experience for me because my dad was the man who masterminded the great train robbery. So this show, what it's about, as most people misconstrue it, I'm not actually advocating or trying to build these people up. What I'm saying this is a sign of the times that all of these people have got books out, films planned, they become almost household names. And what's it all about? Why are we turning cons into icons? Dave Courtney, celebrity gangster. What the fuck does that mean? What does celebrity gangster mean? That this man is running around, it's a walking paradox. How can somebody be a villain but actually be a media personality? and fated like he is. It's like lock, stock and two smoking barrels, Vinnie Jones's character. Where is the moral? The film world is only too willing to indulge this fascination with gangsters. Courtney himself had one of his dirty deeds immortalized in the film Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. This is the scene where I've done one of my most um, talked about items. I give the geezer a good clump under a sunbed, and in the Lockstock film, they use that story as a part of the film where Billy Jones bashed him up under a sunbed. A big 20 stone fella lying there with a red things on, on, on his eyes, and he was fast asleep, and I opened it up like this and done what I was paid to do. Courtney is beginning to understand the media. He knows his big cigars will make people excited. He can tell tales of grievous bodily harm and leave people in stitches. Today, he's come to a club in Soho to give Channel 4 an entertaining interview on the subject of drug dealing. Every time we've met him, there seems to be someone from Channel 5, someone from somewhere else, uh, reporters from GQ, film producers trying to do movies of his life and the rest of it. I think it's the lock, stock and two smoking barrels thing, you know. He's the guy that Vinnie Jones's character was based on, and that kind of fascinates people. The idea that someone who was, a, you know, a character that was a, a big kind of pop cultural reference was based on a real person, and that real person is willing to talk to people and to kind of play the part of Dave Courtney, because he's, I mean, it seems to me Dave Courtney is an actor who plays Dave Courtney all the time, and he's very good at it. He's been doing it all his life. And uh, it's, a, it's a performance that you kind of marvel at. He's very good value. He's a very interesting man. But former crime journalist Ian Edmondson knows that the grim reality of Courtney's violent past is far removed from the romantic portrayal in gangster films. He says Courtney should be rewarded not with a celebrity career, but a jail sentence. Dave should, uh, should be in prison. Uh, but he's escaped uh, a number of charges um, where life should have been the sentence. But if he takes another man's life, then life should be the sentence. Kenny Noyes um, recently been sent down for the murder of one man. Dave has uh, admitted to at least, at least two killings. Um, uh, you know, whether they be uh, underworld figures, and uh, he was in the old argument about he only killed his own, but um, murder is still murder. He's a very nasty and a very dangerous character. There was an instance where um, I'm attributed to cutting someone's finger off. Right? The reason that that was is because he'd knocked me for an awful lot of money that people around me were going to make sure that he paid for, and he was publicly humiliating by saying he wasn't going to do it. You know, like they call it and all that, and it was going to be at a certain party that was being held at the coast, and an awful lot of people that I knew were going down there, and they intended to cut him to ribbons for me. And taking this problem in hand myself, I went down there, someone grabbed hold of him and I chopped off his little finger for stealing from me. But if you speak to that same man today, which I still do, he now knows what the alternative was going to be. And um, he will say thank you. Behind the smiling facade of Dave Corney is a very nasty man, he's very dangerous. Um, 
he will smile at you, and uh, but if you piss him off, um, God help you, you know, you will see the real uh, Dave Courtney and not the glitzy showbiz glamour side that um, he's been known for since, say, the Cray funeral. It's December 1999, and Courtney has hired the Talk of London to put on his own show, which involves talking about himself for three hours. The audience consists entirely of Courtney's friends, none of whom have paid. Aspiring filmmakers Johnny Knox and Nick Moorcroft have also arrived to see the show and even go backstage to wish him good luck. They are keen to include Courtney in a feature film they want to make. They believe with Courtney on board, they can make it big in Hollywood. You're a king. You're better. You're a fucking queen. Yeah, fucking And so I actually get something caught, and they say, well, had you not introduced this courier to this Colombian drug dealer, he would not have gone and brought the gear back. You know? And my answer to that was, I said, well, then, purely hypothetical, Your Honor. I said, if I introduce you to that lady customs officer over there, and she ends up giving you a dose, is that my fault? <laughs> I mean, I don't introduce you, but you put your cock in, you know? <laughs> right, so it really isn't my fault. We want to cast him as a torturer. That's, you know, that's something... Play you know, to the man's else. strengths, Play first of all. Yeah, yeah. But how do Knox and Moorcroft and the rest of the media industry justify glorifying a vicious criminal like Dave Courtney? I feel very sorry for, you know, maybe some of the people who it may have affected, but I'm sure those people affected, affected a lot of other people. And it could go on and on. We could sit here for hours and discuss, does crime pay? Is crime right? How it's do you feel morally? Air. You know? It's like, it's like Jonah's quote, let, let thee who is without sin cast the first stone. It's true. People come back from wars, you know, killed thousands of innocent people and war heroes, and they write their biographies and not an eye is turned, you know. So I, I don't have any problem with this celebrity villain thing. I really don't. But I, I do believe we acted respons a bit responsible in the way of publishing the book. Um, and, but I, I also think we, we treated it as a bit of fun as well, because there's a lot of fun in the book. Whilst we are giving exposure to Dave, by giving him a page, it is entertaining. Besides which, I mean, you know, we're giving him a page. It seems that, um, I mean, effect effectively, you're giving him a documentary. So um, you have no right whatsoever to ask me that question, and you know it. I'm just going to get me hamper. It's six months since the launch of Courtney's autobiography. Although on the surface his celebrity career is going well, it hasn't proved as lucrative as he had hoped. He's now relying on friends for financial support. So who is that? That's Brendan. That's, uh, that's the friend I've seen most of, you know. All that best friend and all that, that, that don't really sort of cut with me, but he's, he's the man I see most. You know, I see him a couple of times a day, he only lives on the road. And um, he helps keep me afloat at the moment. You know, that's Brendan is just keeping me afloat until all of a sudden they go, Hollywood. Courtney's partner, Jenny, was working as a dancer when she met him. They've now been together 11 years and have six children between them. She's happy to support Courtney in his bid for fame, but she is less happy about the money it's bringing in. No, we're not better off financially now. Right. The book hasn't actually brought us, like, you know, millions. I don't feel like, you know, it's just, it's, it's pittance, really, honestly. Dave can earn more than, more than that in, like, 20 minutes. If Courtney ever decided to return to crime, Jenny would not be disappointed and leaps to the defence of his criminal methods. I don't think there's anything that, no, there isn't anything that Dave's done, that Dave's ever done, that, I, that I've actually, you know, that I'm aware of. That, that is wrong, that I'd say, Dave, that was wrong. You shouldn't have done that. Like someone steals from you, right? To make sure they don't steal from you again, you've got to lose one of their fingers in you. Wouldn't you? 
Can I have your autograph? Oh. Johnny Knox and Nick Moorcroft have made another short film with Courtney and have asked him to perform a pre-screening stunt. The audience is delighted with Courtney's gangster capers and he is much in demand at the drinks party that follows. But Knox and Moorcroft have bigger plans for their gangster friend. They have written a full-length feature film script in which Courtney would play a British gangster in L.A. They have arranged to meet Courtney at the Atlantic Bar in Piccadilly to discuss the film, which they hope to sell to a big Hollywood studio. Right, so you've got the script there. Now, what are your ideas? Good script. Good, good lines, but some of them are a little bit... Cheeky what, chirpy. Yeah, 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 A little yeah. bit cauliflower You wouldn't actually me. say in real yeah. life, you know, apples and pears, I've never said that. And what I'm actually saying is, is right, but how I'm actually saying some of it is not right. You is understand violent what I mean? enough? It's very violent, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, give me a semi-hard on. <laughs> I'm ever so sorry. <laughs> but the thing is, with this uh, L.A. movie, it's not you being the shark in a, in a pond. It's you being a big fish in a fucking massive ocean, you know. And if you can go over there and do the business in a, in a, in American film, without the baggage, you know, without, without the, the baggage, little detractors, just you on your own, you, without the gangster me. violence, yeah, without all that shit, you yes, as an actor yeah. in an American film directed by, you know, me, produced by Johnny, proper going for it. You know, people are going to listen. They're going to take Dave Courtney as an actor very seriously. You know, they like, they Definitely. like you out there. They love you. Yeah. But they want to see you in something developed. They want to see more of you, I think. I think they want to see more about what they've read about. That's what it is. You know, when we were out there, I mean, that was the main feedback we got. They've read about you in the, in, in the autobiography. They've seen, you know, the pictures, the stories. Now they want to see you on screen doing it. The whole film genre now has completely changed. And once upon a time, there was a machine which governed the maxim, crime doesn't pay. Nowadays, the machine seems to have broken down or it's been supplicated with cash. Greed has brought over morals and the media industry. So greedy now to exploit something which has always been a hands-off phenomena in this country. True crime has never been able to have been glamorised, and now it is. The bottom line of it is this, you know, I'm playing me and we want eight mil for it, right? You know, men. Over there, you're a fresh character. You are what you are rather than what you may have been. Exactly. And that's where the important thing is. I don't know the statistics of how you break down eight million pounds, but what would I get out of that? Roughly, within about 50p. You know, for Guy Ritchie, he's done well out of lock, stock and two smoking barrels. Oh, very, yeah. very well. You'd be looking at, you know, you'd be looking at, you know, millionaire status without a doubt if it went off. Yeah. Without a doubt. That's what's like I would live with that. Commit. <laughs> Unfortunately for Courtney, a problem has arisen that could scupper his bid for fame. At the end of 1999, he's called to Bow Street Magistrates Court, charged with conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. If he is found guilty, he faces a lengthy prison sentence and the end of his celebrity career. And to find out how that turns out, join us for our third and final visit to Dave Courtney's Underworld tomorrow night at the slightly earlier time of 10.50. The producers would like to point out that in last night's episode we showed pictures from Charlie Cray's funeral rather than Ronnie Cray's. Richard Grayston, who provided security for Charlie Cray's funeral, has no connection with Dave Courtney.